I see a few people coming in. I'm just going to wait one minute for those coming in to get into the room. Since um, the rate of entry has um, stabilized a bit. So welcome everyone to the Black Opportunity Fund and Public Health Agency of Canada workshop on data for action to promote health equity, an introduction to health inequity monitoring in Canada. And um, at this workshop, the Public Health Agency of Canada is going to be presenting on their data tool. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that um, <coughs> um, I am located in Treaty 7 territory, and I'll um, encourage you all to reflect on the land that you're located in, including the history and the historical uh, the historical conditions and present conditions of those that of indigenous people on those land. I would like to pay tribute to the traditional territory of the people of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised of the Sisika, the Pikanai, the Kanai First Nation, the Susina First Nation, um, and the Stony Nakoda. Um, the city of Calgary is also um, home to Métis Nation of um, Albada. Um, so our agenda, we would um, um, have a um, land acknowledgement, which I just did, Public Agency of Canada presentation for about 30 minutes and then we'll have question and um, discussion. And my colleague, Dr. Um, Ato Sekiotu, co-chair of the Black Opportunity Fund Health Working Group will give a closing um, statement. Next slide, please. So remember um, that we are recording this session. You are able to listen to this session in either English or French. If you look below, there is a place for um, um, to caption to, to be able to translate. And um, there's going to be a question and discussion section to follow um, um, for about 15 minutes or so at the end of the session. So keep your, your question and you can use the question in a Zoom feature to um, ask any questions that you have. Next slide. So um, I'll, I'll like to... Um, 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 introduce our speakers from, from today, all from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Our first speaker is Dolan, um, Dolan, Char, um, Dolan Chararavati, who is the acting manager of the Equity Analysis Policy Branch with Strategic Policy Branch at the Public Health Agency of Canada, where she leads the Pan-Canadian Health Inequities Reporting Initiative. Dolan holds a PhD as well as a Master's of Health Science from the University of Toronto, the Lalana School of Public Health. Our interest includes health inequity, the impact of racism and discrimination on health and environmental health. I'd also like to introduce to you Natalie Osorio, who is a policy analyst in the Health Inequity Policy Directorate of PIAC. She's a knowledge mobilization co-lead for the Pan Canadian Health Inequity Reporting Initiative. She has developed many knowledge mobilization products for the initiative and is currently working on related products for the upcoming report on mental health inequities. She holds a bachelor's in nutrition from the University of Montreal and is a registered dietitian. And she completed a master's at the University of Montreal specializing in health promotion and prevention. Matthew Perks, um, holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Waterloo and specializing in qualitative research methodology, particularly participant observation and ethnography with a strong focus on digital methods. Matthew has extensive experience working internationally, having collaborated with researchers and institutions across Canada. And he's currently with the Public Health Agency of Canada where he conducts critical research on the systemic and structural barriers leading to health inequities in Canada. So welcome Dolon, uh, Matthew, and um, I'm Natalie. Next slide, please. So I will now pass it to my colleagues from the Public Health Agency of Canada. 
Thank you, Bacola. Um, I, yes, so Matthew, I think uh, one of us is putting the slides up. Great. So it's very nice to be here today to present to all of you as part of the Black Opportunities Fund. As Bukula mentioned, my name is Dolan Chakravarti and I'm the acting manager of the equity analysis and policy research team at the Public Health Agency of Canada. I'm speaking to you today from Toronto, Ontario, which is situated on Treaty 13 and the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and now is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inui, and Métis peoples. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues, Matthew and Natalie. And Matthew, do you want to go next? Yeah, thank you, Dolan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Perks. I'm a researcher with the Equity Analysis and Policy Research Team at the Public Health Agency of Canada. And I'm speaking to you today from Jojage, also known as Montreal, Quebec, uh, which I want to acknowledge as the unceded traditional land of the Binye Gahaga, um, or otherwise known as the Mohawk Nation. I'll pass it to Natalie to introduce herself. Thank you, Matthew. I'm Natalie Osorio, policy analyst within the same team as Matthew and Dolan. And I'm also presenting today from Montreal. Thank you. So next slide, please. So um, the goal of today's presentation is to provide an overview of the work we do at the Public Health Agency of Canada within our team of EPER, as we call it, so mm -hmm. it's equity analysis and policy research. And we are um, pri primarily responsible for running the Pan-Canadian Health Inequalities Reporting Initiative. We'll provide some examples from a recently re released report on inequalities in mental health, well-being in Canada, uh, well-being and wellness in Canada. And then we'll provide a short demonstration of the health inequalities data tool which is an inaugural product of our initiative, which has been publicly available since 2017 and has been recently updated in 2022 with new indicators and stratifiers. Next slide, please. So our Health Inequalities Reporting Initiative, or HERI as we like to call it for short, was launched in 2012 to inform action on health equity. It's the first pan-Canadian effort to strengthen the measurement, monitoring, and reporting of health inequalities at the federal, provincial, and territorial level. So in our initiative, we draw from more than 20 different data sources, again, to strengthen knowledge and action on health inequities in Canada. And we do this by improved data, data infrastructure, as well as monitoring and reporting on health and their social determinants. Our products, in addition to our health inequalities data tool, include scientific reports, knowledge translation products such as infographics. We do capacity building activities to advance health equity through the co-development and co-design in ongoing partnerships with more than 30 different organizations. As part of this initiative, we receive ongoing guidance and input from our Indigenous partners at all stages of um, our research processes mm -hmm. to ensure that reporting is consistent with the perspectives and priorities of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. Many of our projects, such as our newly released mental health report that Matthew will be going and describing and giving you a bit of a feed, um, kind of presentation on, as well as some of our work on culturally responsive data practices have involved partnering with black scholars and organizations. Um, for instance, we've partnered with Dr. Bukola Salami on one of our, our initiatives. Next slide, please. So I wanted to emphasize that it's really important that we note that the work that we do in health equity surveillance builds on international and domestic commitments towards improving health equity, such as the Rio Political Declaration on the Social Determinants of Health, the WHO's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, Closing the Gap Report, Sustainable Development Goals, as well as SGBA Plus, which is Sex and Gender Based Analysis Plus, federal initiative to incorporate um, disaggregated data looking at sex, uh, gender, as well as intersectional factors affecting equality, inequalities in health. Next slide, please. 
Health equity um, data supports the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada. So our current Chief Public Health Officer, who many of you might be familiar with, is Dr. Teresa Tam. She was highly visible during COVID-19 pandemic. And she's identified that health equity is a cross-cutting priority, emphasizing that the social determinants of health are necessary to consider. Uh, and she's uh, kind of looked at that throughout her annual reports on examining the state of public health in Canada. Next slide, please. So what can we do with health equity data? We kind of try and apply it in many different realms to strengthen evidence, to integrate equity principles in health sector decision-making, to build health public health capacity, to inform intersectoral partnerships, and to respond to international and domestic commitments related to health equity. Next slide, please. Here we've listed uh, many of our different partners and, invite and advisory bodies guiding our reporting activities that really reflect the wide breadth of partnerships and engagement that we are involved in. Launched in 2012, HERI is led by our organization, the Public Health Agency of Canada, in collaboration with Statistics Canada, provincial and territorial government partners, and key non-governmental data custodians. As I mentioned earlier, we also engage um, with national Indigenous organizations to ensure that the unique priorities, worldviews, and circumstances of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people are reflected in all aspects of our work. Our reporting is guided by a technical group that includes partners from academia, other government departments, national Indigenous organizations, and community organizations. I'll now turn it into, uh, sorry, I'll turn it over to uh, Matthew, who will give you an overview of our mental health inequalities in Canada report. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Um, so we wanted to highlight one product that was a recent release for us, which I was on mental health inequalities in Canada. Um, and so we undertook this project to enhance our knowledge of the role of the social and structural determinants of mental health in Canada, uh, to inform public health and intersectoral action to target the modifiable factors influencing inequitable differences in mental health experienced by different population groups in Canada, and to complement ongoing mental health work in the health portfolio, providing new insights for concerted action. Next slide, please. So the project itself includes several different deliverables, which have now been released. And so these include a narrative report of approximately 160 pages with a discussion on mental health conceptualization, uh, Canadian evidence on four main themes, and a discussion of policy considerations. Uh, this report combines both qualitative and quantitative data and explores trends in mental health inequalities over time over a 10 year period. Uh, there's also an executive summary, which is a um, sort of synthesized shorter form of the report. And then there's an extension of the health inequalities data tool, which Natalie will be going through later, which focuses specifically on mental health inequality trends across different mental health outcomes, which are listed uh, on the right there in blue, um, and then disaggregated by several different uh, factors. And finally, there's four infographics that are currently still in development, but these will be summarizing the key findings from each of our main chapters. Uh, next slide, please. And so as Dolan mentioned earlier, um, we set up a multidisciplinary advisory committee, uh, which provided us scientific and technical insight throughout the project from its conception to its release. And so here's just a list with some of the experts that were involved in the project. So members came from community organizations such as Black Health Alliance, uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association, EGAL, First Peoples Wellness Circle is just a few. Next slide, please. And so the four main themes of the report um, which the report delves into in detail in four distinct chapters, um, are socioeconomic conditions, impacts on mental health, racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and discrimination, impacts on mental health, a sense of belonging, social supports, and cultural connections, and then access, quality, and use of healthcare services. And so for each of these themes, I'm going to show an example from the report that includes one of the qualitative findings and one of the quantitative findings. Uh, these next slides have a lot of information on them, um, but just so you know, uh, all this information is available on the data tool itself, which we'll put the links in the chat for. Uh, so for the socioeconomic conditions and mental health chapter, 
Uh, we found that racialized immigrants face employment challenges such as unrecognized foreign credentials, occupational mismatch, underemployment, and language barriers, which can lead to mental health consequences. And from the qualitative evidence, unemployment and poor quality work conditions are disproportionately experienced by communities living in historically underserved conditions, uh, including indigenous, black, and racialized populations, as well as immigrants. Next slide. From the discrimination and mental health chapter, uh, we found that high self-rated mental health is declining over time for racialized immigrants and racialized non-immigrants. Um, and this was particularly seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. From the qualitative evidence, experiences of racism and xenophobia negatively affect stress levels, perceptions of safety, sense of social connectedness, and self-esteem among racialized and immigrant populations. Next slide, please. Uh, for the community belonging chapter, uh, we found that inequalities in life satisfaction and high self-rated mental health increased over time for individuals with weaker versus stronger sense of community belonging. Um, in particular, between 2007 and 2022, heterosexual individuals consistently reported stronger community belonging than LGB individuals. From the qualitative evidence, uh, increasing community belonging within key populations, such as racialized immigrants and 2SLGBTQI plus individuals, uh, directly contributed to reduced feelings of loneliness, improving mental health. And in particular as well, recent immigrants face hurdles like language barriers, employment issues, and discrimination that prevented them from integrating into the local community. Next slide, please. Uh, for access, quality, and use of healthcare services, uh, we found that unmet need for mental health services has been consistently higher for racialized versus white populations over time. And our results also show higher unmet need for mental health services for people identifying as female versus male, immigrant versus non-immigrant, and gay, lesbian, or bisexual versus heterosexual. From the qualitative evidence, women, transgender individuals, indigenous peoples, and black communities reported experiences of stigma, double standards, and a lack of cultural sensitivity when receiving mental health and substance use treatment. Um, so that was a lot of information, but that summarizes some of the, the key findings from the four chapters. Um, I'm now going to pass it to Natalie, who's going to give you an overview of our health inequalities data tool and our um, mental health da uh, dashboard. Thank you, Matthew. So now we'll move on to a bit of an orientation on the health inequalities data tool, which is one of our main products from the Pan-Canadian Health Inequalities Reporting Initiative. So here, uh, before we go on the actual web platform, uh, we just wanted to give you an overview of what you can find in this data tool. So we have over 175 health-related indicators that are separated into health status and health determinants. And these indicators can be stratified by a range of social and demographic stratifiers, meaningful to health equity, which are separated into different categories. So socioeconomic status, including income, education, employment, indigenous identities, place of residence, either urban, rural, or remote, and different population groups, um, such as immigration status, sexual orientation, when it is available. And the Indicators are also available for male or female and by jurisdiction. So now I'll just um, briefly start sharing my screen to open the, the web-based platform. So just give me one second to share the screen for the data tool. And Matthew will be putting in the chat the different links. So he'll put in the chat the link to the data tool and also the link to our new report on mental health inequalities. So before we dive into the actual examples to show you some of the indicators that are available on the data tool, I'm just going to go through the different tabs that we have at the top. So here um, is a tab where you'll find all the examples, all the indicators for health inequalities. On the second tab, what's really interesting is that you can see the rates by province and territory. It's basically the same tab as the first one, but you can see just at one glance, the comparison between all the provinces and territories. The third tab, you'll find a brief description of what it 
is um, that our data tool is about, so about health inequalities. You'll also see some of the international and domestic drivers that Dolan mentioned at the beginning. And you can also see here, I'm just gonna click. There's a two page overview summarizing what the data tool is and a brief a summary of the indicators, the stratifiers, the measures that we use. So we have effect measures and population impact measures and the list of all the data sources from which we draw our data. So let's just go back. On the about the indicators, you're gonna see all the indicators that are available on the data tool. And we took a life course approach to separate all the indicators. So you'll see that we have general population, infant, children, youth, and young adults, adults and seniors. And if you scroll a bit down, you'll see the indicator description, the source and the year, the method of calculation. And if you click here, you'll be able to see all the stratifiers that are available for that specific indicator. And finally, the publication tab, which is really interesting because here in one place, you'll find all the products that our initiative has produced, including our report from 2018, so key health inequalities in Canada. We also have the social inequalities in COVID-19 deaths in Canada. And we did two of these reports. The, the last one was updated in 2022. And how to integrate intersectionality theory and the fourth one, monitoring changes in health inequalities. These two last reports informed our last report on mental health. And here we have the infographics, so different editions. We have the 2017 editions and the 2022. One um, infographic that might be of interest is uh, inequalities in mental health by income, and this one, inequalities for racialized adults. And you can see just here all the other different products that we have. So now let's dive into the actual um, data, so the examples. And the idea here is really just to kind of play around a bit with the data tool to show you how you can navigate yourself. This is a public facing uh, web platform. Anybody can have access to it and you can uh, find the data to inform your decisions, policies, programs. So I'll just go here with some examples. So let's start. So. Let's pick our edition. As you can see, we have the 2017 edition, but we'll pick for this instance, 2022, given that it's the latest iteration of the data tool. We'll keep um, national data, but here you can pick um, the province and territory that you wish. And here are the different um, framework components. So if you remember, um, I mentioned that our indicators are separated into two categories. So health status and health determinants. And um, we're gonna pick right now disease and health condition. And the indicator here, we're gonna take a diabetes, including gestational self-reported. The life course, um, for this specific indicators, we have two life course, so seniors or adults. We're gonna pick adults. And our stratifier, we're gonna um, take cultural racial background, but you see that there's like, all of these that are available for um, this indicator. And finally, for the measure, um, I'm gonna take rate ratio. And it's really important and something I wanna mention that when we are talking about inequalities, it's important to take one relative measure and one absolute measure. So basically the rate ratio will compare two groups and the rate difference will give us the absolute difference between the two groups that we are comparing. So here for the rate ratio, and just also as a side note, I'm talking about inequality measures, but we do have a document here that explains um, what it is um, that we can use, like all the measures. So rate ratio, I mentioned rate difference. So we are giving you examples of how to interpret the numbers that you are going to find. So that's a little side note for you to know. So let's go back to our example. Perfect, so everything is still selected. So that's also another thing. So if you decide to leave the data tool and if you come back, it's always going to, to be at the place where you left. So the examples that you chose, um, that, that is going to be um, where you come back to. 
So if we see here the results, um, another feature that we have is that you can see for uh, both sexes. So you can see here it's in green. You can select and deselect. So if you just wanted to see for both sexes, what are the rate ratios you're able to see here. But if we wanted to compare, let's say just males and females together and remove both sexes, you can also do that. So I'll just select everything. So here, what we can see is that compared to white adults, so our reference group here is white adults, uh, the prevalence of diabetes is 1.9 times higher among Black adults. And if we want to know what the absolute difference is, we can just go and pick rate difference. And we can see that um, per 100 people, approximately six more Black adults report having diabetes compared to our reference group, which are white adults. So now let's do another example in another framework component. So now we'll move on to health determinants. We'll pick social inequities. And now let's pick food insecurity. For this one, you can see that we have more uh, life course approach uh, stages, sorry. So we have youth, adult, seniors, so we'll pick adults. We'll keep the same stratifier. And now we are going to take again the rate ratio. So you can see that um, a lot of the racialized groups um, are reporting living in food insecurity. And if we see here, one of the groups that have the highest uh, prevalence, so we see here um, Black adults reported um, experiencing 2.8 times higher um, the prevalence of food insecurity compared to white adults. And again, if we look at the rate difference in absolute difference, we'll see that it's almost 13 adults per 100 people. So these are just some of the examples that we can find. And just if we go lower, you'll see that there's the full table with all the results. And if you wanna do your own analysis or graphs, you're able to either download the summary table or download the detail table. So it's gonna be a CVS file uh, with all the data. And important to note that, for example, here, if you look at um, the data for South Asian females, you're going to see that it's um, highlighted in yellow. And it's important to know that in some instances, you'll have these indications, either yellow, red, or blue. And when you see, um, for example, in this case, yellow, it's to be reported with caution. So that's something to take into consideration when you are using the data. So that kind of um, wraps up the examples I wanted to give to you. And hopefully it was useful for you to see how to navigate a bit our data tool. And um, before I finish, I also just wanted to um, share with you a bit of our platform. We talked a lot about our mental health report. And here you'll see that you have the highlights. So the executive summary, and it's available at HTML, but also a downloadable PDF. We have the full report, the technical notes, and finally, the data tool. So what's really um, different from our data tool that I just showed is the trends. So here you'll see that there's different time points. Um, so we have five different time points where you can see how the trends, um, so the changes over time for that specific indicator. And you'll be able to explore within a single stratifier or by more than one stratifier. And you have here all the indicators related to mental health outcomes and the available stratifiers. And also important to note that we are currently working to adding this uh, a trends tab to our bigger data tool, which will be available um, soon before the end of this year, hopefully. 
So I hope you enjoyed seeing our different tools and now I'll turn it back to our moderators. Thank you. Excellent. Wow, I'm excited now. Uh, we can, um, we have the data that we need right at our fingertips, um, especially this I think will be especially very helpful to black community organizations looking to develop proposals and the needing to justify, for example, justify issues related to food security, insecurity, or justify issues related to diabetes among black population. I wonder if there are any questions. I have not seen any, but um, um, I would ask a question if you can put, um, especially the one about food insecurity up, um, because I know some of our colleagues from community organization may want a better interpretation of some of the data or drafts that you have shown. So if there are no questions, I'll just ask around until, or my colleague, Dr. Ato Sekiotu can also um, ask any questions. Um, um, so if you can just put that, um, um, the one about food insecurity. Um, someone had a question. Can you post your question in the quest Q and A? It's at the bottom of the screen. There's a Q and A session, uh, Q and A button, I mean tab. Or you can also post it in chat, I'm fine with either. Oh yeah. Can the stratifiers also act as co-founders? So I think um, to make things easier for um, those here, um, uh, especially people from community organizations, maybe it would be good to describe what a stratifier is, what a co-founder is, and can a stratifier act as co-founder? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so for our stratifiers, when we use that term, um, we're talking about how we're going to disaggregate the data further down by a subpopulation. So for example, like on screen, like Natalie is showing, we're stratifying by um, cultural and racial background to get a more discrete look at the inequalities. Um, in some cases, some stratifiers can act as confounders. Um, it really depends on the case. Um, for example, this was something we encountered when we were working on our mental health inequalities report, um, was thinking about community belonging. Um, in some cases, community belonging can be an outcome of positive mental health, but it can also be a determinant to, of mental health as well. Um, and so this sort of goes into when you're looking at this data, you really want to be thinking about sort of the other factors that could be sort of uh, affecting it since you are only looking at one stratification at a time in most cases. Thank you so much. And I will ask a question in terms of, so when I look at this data monitoring tool, and I'm just asking this for those um, in our um, in our um, in our meeting that are not um, quantitative researchers, you see um, when you look at the graphs, you see the line that is very thin on top, that stretches on top. And what does that mean relative to the one that is the main bar? So those are the confidence intervals. Um, so when you see the, the small line there reaching up to the top, and it actually reaches down to the bottom, usually about the same relative amount. Um, and that's what we leave as a little bit room for error. Uh, so because we the data source is coming from a health survey, so it's coming from the Canadian Community Health Survey, um, we're making estimates, right? Because we didn't obviously sample everyone in the country, but we um, Statistics Canada sampled a representative sample. And so when we do the calculations, we leave a, a room for error based on the sample size that that indicator was looking at. Thank you so much. Um, Maria Hacks, you mentioned 20 resources you use to strengthen knowledge on health inequity. What are those resources? Can we have access to them? So I think was the question referring to um, the publications page? Uh, um, it could be the publications page. Something will tell me that it is possible that these are things like the Canadian Community Health Survey, the Canadian Health Measures. I'm assuming that's what it means, the Canadian Health Measures Survey and, 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 and where you got your data from to be able to actually build this up. 
Yes, so it's actually um, when Dolan was talking about, we draw on data from more than 20 different data sources. So if um, I went over very quickly, but when you click on uh, each indicator, you'll have the specific data source for the indicator that you're looking at. But also the full list of sources are available on our data tool overview. Um, I don't know, um, Matthew, did you put the, the link to the overview? Uh, yeah, the overview is that, that one's, yeah, it's a the two-page PDF that I went quickly over that will have the full list of data sources that we use for the data tool. Yeah, and I should say at least I'm familiar with a few of them, the Canadian Community Health Survey, the Canadian Health Media Survey. Now, it will be much easier for you to use this tool than to go to those sources because you need to get Statistics Canada clearance, you need to go to a lab, you need to be a number cruncher, you need to be able to crunch numbers. So basically what has been done here is try as much as possible to simplify the data that we already have on Statistics Canada, um, data sources that you need special clearance and security clearance to get through, simplify it and make it actually easily accessible to, to the community. That's right. So I guess, uh, you know, building on what um, Bukola just said, we've amalgamated uh, various different sources of data from our partners. So including some of the surveys that were mentioned from Statistics Canada in order to populate the data tool, which you can then kind of use and download um, according to the way we've kind of organized. But we, our program does not provide access to the specific data sources. So that would have to be negotiated through Statistics Canada or the other providers. If you're part of a university, you can go through a research data center. So there's other mechanisms. But as Bukola explained, you know, we've tried to um, integrate this, these different sources of data that, where we can illustrate and analyze inequalities in, in health. Thank you so much. And um, I think the next question is basically, what are you working on? What updates and tools can we expect to be released in the near future? I think this was mentioned, on, although I missed it. So what tools do you um, either report? Because reports are even much more easily digestible, even more than the tool, um, or, or uh, measures that you're thinking of integrating into um, the tool. Natalie, do you want to speak to the interventions work? Yes. So I'll before I, I go into that, I'll just uh, something I did mention while I was presenting is the added tab that we'll add in the data tool for the trends so that the trends will be available uh, for other indicators, others than the ones we already have for mental health and mostly CCHS. So um, indicators will be available for trends analysis, but there's also something else that we've been working on that would also be featured on our data tool is um, an inventory of interventions for four um, main topics. So unhealthy eating, physical activity, tobacco use, and alcohol use. And uh, this will feature, um, basically it's from a systematic review that we work um, alongside um, Upstream Lab and um, it will have all the interventions. You'll be able to filter through different intervention settings, population groups, the year of publication, study design. So just to give you a little glimpse of what you'll be able to navigate. And that will show you some of the interventions that have been um, done in those different uh, topics. Wow, I think this will be really, really nice because then what it means is that not only you're preparing a proposal, you can say black population have a higher rate of diabetes and you know maybe low income have a higher rate of diabetes or black population have a higher rate of diabetes. And then you can go somewhere else on the website and say, and diabetes, all these interventions have been proven to work and maybe black people, you know, this intervention works better for black people in diabetes. So it will help you in terms of different segments of your proposal to know what is the problem and what information do we have across the globe on how to fix it. I'm excited, sorry. Um, um, and um, um, uh, Buki asks, please run us through your methodologies for collecting the data, including sample size. Where there are limitations you had during the data collection process, also, over what period of time did you collect your data for each edition? 
So um, if you're referring to the data tool, it depends on the, um, the source for each indicator. Um, so as Natalie showed, some of them come from the Can Canadian Community Health Survey. Uh, some come from the Canadian Health Measures Survey um, and uh, other sources like vital statistics or um, death records, that kind of thing. Um, we often combine cycles to increase the sample size so that we have better reportability. So for example, a lot of them will be um, from the 2015 to the 2018 cycles of the CCHS. Uh, we don't actually do any of the data collection for the data tool. That's all done by Statistics Canada. Um, and then that's data that we access through a partnership with them so that we're able to run the analyses and generate the inequality measures. Thank you. Um, so if I'm just to retreat, um, the analysis, um, the data collection is collected by Statistics Canada, not Public Health Agency of Canada. Public Health is just helping to digest and disseminate some of those data. And I think many of the data sources that you've used is Canadian Community Health Survey, which has a population of, I think they interview, they, they collect data from 60,000 people um, every year. And when you um, add them up over a period of time and, and move them together, then you have a bigger sample size. Canadian Health Measure Survey tends to collect data from around 5,000 people every year. It's a smaller data set. So for each of the data, and I think at the bottom of the, of the data description that you have, you will have the name of the um of the of the survey tool or where the data is from. So easy thing that you can easily do. I don't know if there's a link to ClinCon, or you can just easily Google Canadian Community Health Survey, and you will be able to see there how the data was collected. So do you have a comment? Yeah, I in addition, you know, if you're looking towards, you know, each indicator, you'll have at the bottom of the page an explanation, uh, along with technical notes. Uh, we also have data dictionaries. We have a lot of resources on our on our site that describes the methods that we have used in order to generate um, the inequality measures and indicators. Um, and so you can reference a lot of that information on our site. Thank you so much. Um, um, the next person asks, which communities or intersectional identities are facing the greatest mental health challenges? Can you disaggregate the data by sub community, e.g. Jamaican? So for example, you have said here black, but we also know that within black communities that there are white um, differences in terms of inequities within black communities. So is it possible if someone say, okay, I want to look at data on Jamaican people. I want to look at data on Nigerian people. Will you be able to do that here? And Nadir, and which uh, communities are facing the greatest identity? So I think those are two questions. Um, I can answer um, the first part and then maybe Dolan, you can answer about the the communities that are facing the larger challenges. Um, for the disaggregated data, um, the CCHS does collect additional information about, uh, say, country of origin or is more specific on some cultural and racial communities. Unfortunately, with our data tool, if we were to disaggregate any further, the data wouldn't be reportable or it wouldn't be reliable. Um, so we only at, right now are able to go as far down as just Black people in Canada. Um, but unfortunately, right now, we're not able to do any further. And 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 if I'm too hard to that, CCH has 60,000 participants. So yes, um, you will be able to, um, if you were a researcher, or you got permission from Statistics Canada and got the security clearance, you can be able to technically go and say, I want to analyze just Jamaican people and look at the data from Jamaican people. The challenge you will have is, will you be able to vet the data out because of the sample size of Jamaican people within it? Because I know I've had this experience in the past, right? But technically somewhere, in this Canada, there's a place if you wanted to look at Jamaican people's health alone, that you can actually technically do that. Dolan, I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, adding to both your point and Matthew's point, you know, oftentimes when we're looking towards collecting uh, more granular data about specific communities, it's, um, we face challenges. And we all know that because, you know, we've tried to 
push for the collection of race-based data across Canada in you know, multiple different databases, especially since COVID. So um, we face issues of data suppression. Data is often not collected at certain levels. There are standards that are kind of, people are trying to adhere to, but of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with different definitions or different ways people identify with their racial background, ethnic background, et cetera. So there's various limitations and, um, barriers that we face when we try to um, see differences within, you know, communities of people. So that's something that we're aware of. Currently, we don't have any ability to uh, further disaggregate as, as part of our tool, but it's something definitely we're, we're aware of. Um, and we're also aware of the fact that we're trying to take a more intersectional approach to our analytical products and our research. So we are trying to think about systems of power and um, how you know racism and discrimination might impact mental health, for instance. So that's something that we're trying to really incorporate in our in our data tool, in our studies, et cetera, and that hopefully we can um, improve data collection as well as reporting over time. Thank you so much. Um, the next person asks about, um, as a clinician, um, thanks for the great presentation and very informative tool. As a clinician scientist involved in health equity research, I find that there is a very limited self-reported race data. How were you able to get race data for mental health? Um, so our data comes from kind of our partnership with Statistics Canada. Um, so for the mental health data, um, the report, uh, our data comes again from the Canadian Community Health Survey, um, and we're able to combine cycles so that we're able to have reportable data that we're able to desegregate by race. Thank you. And the next person is about gender and sex. So how did you capture, so in the um, presentation, um, you had male versus female, and I believe male versus female is sex, women versus men is gender. Um, how were you able to, um, did you capture or how were you able to capture people that did not identify as male or female or woman or man? Um, so again, a lot of these things come back to the data source themselves. Um, so the CCHS for a very long time only collected uh, sex. So they only asked male, female. And so for a, especially the previous editions of the data tool, we only have data for male versus female. Um, now, Statistics Canada is making changes to expand to include different variables, both for sex and for gender. Uh, so our hope is that in the future, we will be able to sort of drill down a little bit more specifically for those that identify as man, woman, or another identity, um, but also uh, to also still keep data for sex for male, female. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that that's a limitation of the current data we have, but it's been worked on. And um, Black communities, oh, sorry. Are, are, the urban, are there urban and rural differences in mental health? Is there a significant impact on mental health of racialized communities in large urban or smaller rural communities? So is there a way that we can disaggregate our data by both um, race and also urban versus rural? So for both together, um, not with our data tool, just for sample size restrictions, um, but you can look um, for race as, as we've shown. And we do have desegregations for um, remoteness. Uh, so going from very remote areas to easily accessible areas. And then we also have desegregations um, by census metropolitan areas and uh, sort of other indicators of rural urban geography. So there's another question and I'll try to answer this question. Um, black communities are facing high quality of discrimination in the health sector. We are in London, Ontario. Uh, uh, we, we need health services, but it's hard to get a family doctor. Is it possible to help us here in London, Ontario? I think the nice thing about this is that you have the tools, right? So if you're able to do the analysis, of your region, then you can be able to support it in terms of developing proposals for funding to be able to address the needs within the community. So at least, you know, you do have the tools and especially if we have those interventions 
to see in terms of, okay, here is the problem that we have in London, Ontario. It's not just anecdotal, but we have the data and here is how to address it. Then hopefully that will be able to help community organizations in the, in the future. Is there functionality on the online platform to compare trends from the 2017 edition and the 2022? So not directly between the two editions. Um, however, I believe Natalie mentioned that we are hoping to add um, trends to the data tool overall. And so when we sort of do the refresh of the data tool, um, you will be able to look across time for, for our a majority of the indicators that we currently have. Thank you. And um, I'll continue with the questions. I'm enjoying this. I It's like, oh my God, <laughs> why have I not had this in a while um, about this, um, you know, easy access to data. So Sharon Davis Murdoch and Sharon is a community leader um, um, from um, Atlantic Canada, specifically Nova Scotia. When will PHAC present a public facing communication platform to inform about black health inequities and disparities so that all Canadians know about our health status? Um, I can answer that one. Um, so in 2020, PHAC did produce a short publication on um, health determinant, health inequalities and social determinants among black populations in Canada called the Snapshot. Um, Natalie or Matthew, maybe you could put the link to the snapshot in the chat. So we are working with our um, colleagues in the Mental Health of Black Canadians program to update that snapshot and, you know, make it more current. Um, so that's a short, you know, that will be a short report update, as well as, you know, we're working to expand our data on Black populations, as, as Matthew mentioned, on our data tool as much as possible. I am aware that there are a few questions and, you know, um, how, to how many minutes do you think you need for the closing? Uh, just two minutes. Just two, two minutes. minutes. Okay. I do, have, I do have my own questions, but go ahead. Okay. So, Ato, please go ahead and ask the question. Yeah, I mean, great conversation here. You know, just going back to the question about 2017-2022 data collection, um, you know, we had a major event between those two intervals, right, COVID. And so I'm just wondering whether your data, your tool captures some of the inequities, some of the racial differences um, with respect to COVID and uh, particularly with mental health. Yeah, so for the mental health um, report, uh, so we that one is across time that's over a 10 year period and we combined cycles so that we could look at, I believe it's five different time points. Um, our epidemiologists specifically made choices um, on where those cycles sort of like ended and began for the next ones um, so that we could get some idea of a pre and post. Um, now our data only goes up to a certain limit. So we don't, we can see some, the start of some effects um, post COVID, um, but to see whether those start to either balance out or sort of continue either in an upward or a downward trend, um, we'll have to wait a few more cycles, of course. Um, but we are sort of, we are, taking that into consideration uh, for sure. Thank you. The other, the other question I have just pertains to uh, going back to the data collection with StatsCan. And so is there still an opportunity for the next, um, the next data collection to have research in the Black community put input into what questions are asked? I mean, we're only as good as what line of sight you have into and you know if you're not asking the right question you may not see where the problems are so i'm just wondering whether there's an opportunity moving forward whether stats can can contact you know folks like dr salami and you know other research across canada to have input into those necessary questions so our group does work with Statistics Canada and provides input on diff various surveys that are being developed um, over time. So I guess, Dr. Otto, are you thinking about the CCHS in particular, or, uh, you know, like StatCan does have different types of consultation platforms. So for instance, there was recently a reconsideration of the visible minority var variable and what does that mean? Or, you know, how is employment equity defined? So there are these different venues and um, uh, opportunities for participation and consultation. Uh, but it depends on the survey. Again, you know, like we, we end up getting consulted on various survey products because of our work. So 
I think maybe um, investigating whether there's some type of community or academics uh, consultation process on the surveys you're most interested in that might be an area to pursue or advocate for. Thank you. Um, I think maybe I'll take two or three more. Um, will there be desegregated Black stratifier in future products? So Black Caribbean, Black Latin, Black East African. I think this is related to one of the questions that was asked earlier. Yeah, I think um, we always try and, you know, provide as much data as possible, as specific as possible. Um, so we're always trying to drill down as much as possible. If um, if that becomes a, a possibility in the future, you can expect that. Um, but it really depends, again, on, on how StatsCan collects the data and then how we get access to it. And I'm looking at the next question about more, more recent, when will you have more recent data? after COVID-19. I would assume that it depends on when Stats Canada, and it's usually after two years, after Stats Canada has collected the data that it becomes pub public, right? Is that correct? Yeah, roughly, yes. Um, 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 will there be, um, would, would, will we be able um, to view things like preeclampsia rates among black people or vitamin D. So I'm not sure if specifically preeclampsia women's health issues on this. Off the top of my head, I, I don't believe we have an indicator for that. Yeah, no. yeah. And what about cancer? Uh, we do have several indicators for cancer, both uh, overall incidence and prevalence, and then some specific, um, specific uh, cancers as well. But this actually, um, can I just jump in, Bukula? I mean, if there are specific types of um, requests, as we update the snapshot uh, document, we are looking to expand our reporting a little bit. So if there are particular areas of interest from your working group members, maybe just be in touch with us after and we can have a further discussion. So I think I'll just take this last question. And um, my comment is related to um, someone asked, are you going to share how beginners can begin to gain knowledge in research? But um, what my concern is, is some members of our community may go on this site. And yes, it seems so simple for researchers, but for someone that is a, an expert in you know, nursing, an expert in taking care of children, an expert, um, they may not be able to digest this. So I wonder if it is possible to have a video that has the basics of research to understand, you know, what many of these terms on the site means, what, you know, you know, risk ratio and all those means on the site, so that then someone can, so that um, anyone can be able to actually understand. It seems simple, for some of us, but it is you know, way out of you know, people's expertise um, for, for others. Uh, so Natalie's actually putting some resources in the chat. So we do have um, a page that kind of goes over the inequality measures. Um, as well as some examples of how you would interpret that data. So that way you can kind of see how that would fit in a sentence, um, basically, and how you would understand it. So when you go back to the data tool and you see the rate ratio and it's 1.7, you can kind of think of, okay, that I know what this means. That means that this population is more, you know, 1.7 times more likely to experience this than the, the reference population, just as an example. And if you look in the chat, there is an email address. If you have further questions for Statistics Canada for um, about this presentation, there's an email address you can send your, your message to. And now, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this is great. This is excellent. And I cannot wait to go and work on this and see what I can see. You know, I can be able to unravel related to inequities within the Black communities. I will pass it on to Dr. Um, Ato Sekiotu. Uh, thank you, Bokol. And, um, you know, great job tonight, everybody. I mean, we've heard about the Health and Equities uh, Reporting Initiative, HIRI, and some of the health equity data, the health equity data tool and how it's used. Um, 
you know, we know we've known a long time we need data in the Black community. So we have at least one approach to collecting these data and that's available public knowledge, right? And I just, I wish we took a, uh, a pool today about how many people actually knew about this and knew how how to uh, what that's available. So that's amazing. Huge thanks to the uh, members of PHAC today, uh, Natalie Zorio, Matthew Perks, uh, Dolan Chakavati. Um, really, this initiative aligns with what BOF is trying to accomplish here with respect to a black uh, national black health strategy. Um, you know, in particular, I'm looking at the study that you had on mental health, and you highlighted a number of key issues: um, socioeconomic conditions racism, xenophobia, homophobia, discrimination, uh, sense of belonging, social supports, cultural connections, access to uh, quality healthcare. And really these, these same barriers we see in other areas in which the black community, members of the black community are negatively impacted. Um, so we know this aligns with us. Um, I'd like to thank my co-chair, Dr. Pakola Salami for steering this uh, meeting. And of course, uh, Nia in the background for putting everybody, everybody together. Um, just a reminder that, you know, this is only part of a conversation that we're having at BOF uh, towards our town halls that we've done over the spring and summer. So we're going to put this in person the last weekend of January, February, February 1st in Montreal is part of the uh, uh, part of a, a, a Black Health Summit that we're uh, helping to organize. Okay, so uh, we have posted a couple of email addresses in the chat. Uh, one for BOF and one for PHAC. So some of these questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, we can sort of do online, offline. But thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks very much. It was great to be here tonight. Thank good you, night. everyone, so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. For being so late at all, but I was doing vaccination and it went crazy. That's